So last time we were talking about uh, matrices, representations and I said that various groups can be realized as uh, matrices. So table See complex matrices. And then I also mentioned that rotations in two dimensions, they can be understood in terms of matrices. And then there was this uh, rotation matrix, rotation by an angle theta, we had deduced quite easily that it is just cos theta minus sin theta sin theta cos theta that is rotation matrix. But that was in two dimension. So, those are rotations in R2. So, collection of all rotations was called SO2 or SO2 R or it is R2. Now the question is what about higher dimensions? Calculation for this was easy because it was just two dimensional case, but what about SO3, what about rotations in R3, three dimensional thing. So, you imagine one sphere and I am rotating sphere, how can I understand all possible rotations of the sphere. Now, there are some tricky things. One tricky thing is that there are so many axes about which you can rotate. There are infinitely many options for you to pick the axis about which you want to rotate. So there are issues and as we would learn, matrices are not the best uh, notations, they are not the best representations for expressing rotations in three dimensions. And the key word for this talk is keyword for this talk is quaternions. So, quaternions are certain objects, I am going to explain in this lecture and they were discovered in the year 1843 by Hamilton. We are going to learn all that in this lecture and you will also see why quaternions are better options to express rotations in three dimensions. Okay, so let us start, let us start with rotation matrix in R3. So what is happening here? R theta x denotes rotation by angle theta about the axis, about the x, uh, x axis. So, that is rotation about x axis by an angle theta. So, which direction to take clockwise, anti clockwise, what you just fix one convention, you just take this uh, system x y z and just fix one orientation along which you call the angle positive and other where you call angle negative, so just, just your choice. You can see this block, right. So, what, what does the whole matrix do? 
whole matrix keeps the x axis fixed. So, this one corresponds to x axis and whatever rest is there it rotates by angle theta. So, it is quite easy for us to write down the matrix of rotation in R3. So, all this rotation in R3. So, just from the 2D case we could simply write 3D case, but remember the choice of axis is very special x axis is what we have taken. So, uh, writing in this block form and writing 1 0 0 in the row and 1 0 0 in the column is fine. What about other options? For y, for y axis I will have 0 1 0 and 0 1 0 both in column and row because this is what is going to keep y axis intact and then cos theta sin theta minus sin theta cos theta I will have like this I could have taken minus sin theta here and plus sin theta here does not matter it is just a choice of orientation it is just a choice for the direction where you will call your angle positive and your angle negative. And similarly you have r theta z here I am fixing z axis. So, this is the this is very clear cut very obvious calculation where you do not have to do much just right from the two dimensional case you are lifting situation to three dimensions. So, for these three very special axis for x axis for y axis and for z axis it is pretty straightforward for us to write rotations in terms of matrices. But the point is how far can we go with this approach? How far can we uh, use matrices in order to understand rotations in R3? That is going to be interesting question. So, that is what? What about other axes? And there are infinitely many axes. So, are we going to write infinitely many matrices? Or if not, then given a choice of axis and given a rotation angle, what is the expression for the matrix? And as we are going to see, it is quite cumbersome, and that is where we are going to give up matrix notation and we are going to realize the same group, same group as O3 via quaternions. We are going to see that. Okay. So, here is a theorem which is attributed to famous 18th century mathematician Euler and which says that you can combine these basic rotations in order to obtain any other rotation. So, what it says is that any rotation in R3 can be obtained by considering this composition. So, some rotation about z axis some rotation about x axis and again some rotation about same z axis. Uh, how does it work? So, let us see this is the initial position this is the initial sphere and we are going to rotate it. So, first I am rotating uh, about z axis. So, z is fixed z axis and I am having an angle phi. I am having, having angle phi and z axis is fixed. So, x comes to x dash, y goes to y dash. Nothing happens to z because we are uh, rotating about z axis. So, x dash has come here and then I am rotating about x axis by an angle theta. So, I am rotating about x axis. This x is going to be fixed now and the angle which I am taking. So, this is going to be axis an angle by which I am going is theta. So, z will go to some z dash and y will go to some y dash. And then I keep this fixed, this axis fixed. So, here this was the axis, here this is the axis and here in the third step this is the this is the axis. And how much is the angle? Angle is psi, I am just rotating by angle psi. It is not very straightforward to prove this, 
but it would be a good idea if you could work out a proof of it or look uh, for a proof somewhere. It's not an easy theorem as such, but it's interesting fact to know that every rotation is a product of these three basic ones. You notice y is not appearing anywhere. So I, I can pick two axes, two types of matrices and then see the, these two types of matrices I can take this one and this one and I can combine these types of matrices to get all possible rotations in R3. What is the problem with this approach? Well, there are many not just one. So, uh, if my rotation is expressible in this form then these three angles phi, theta and psi, phi, theta and psi they are call, called Euler angles of the rotation. That is very classic way of understanding rotations. However, if you want to do calculations, uh, it does not go too far. So, that is the bad thing, right? From Euler angles, guessing the axis of rotation is very difficult. If I tell you that these three are the angles which you are going to combine in this fashion, even guessing what is going to be the final uh, rotation because product of rotations is going to be rotations. What is the final rotation? And for that final rotation, which is composed composition of all these three, what is going to be the axis? Even guessing that much is very difficult. And then the converse direction, if I give you rotation in R3, uh, guessing what is going to be choice for Euler angles that is very difficult. So, there is a difficulty in both the directions. So, how do you resolve such issues? Okay. So, uh, axis of rotation I take as uh, unit vector and angle of rotation is this angle by which I am going to rotate. So, I have a sphere, I pick an axis, there are so many choices for axis and I rotate it by angle theta. What would be the matrix of this? What would be the matrix of rotation for this? And I am going to show you, you can work it out this one, very complicated. So, if I give you angle of rotation and the axis, this is what it is going to be, very cumbersome expression. So, certainly this is not the way to go uh, with calculations of rotations either. So, Euler angles as I said, there is difficulty and with matrices again there is difficulty, it is cumbersome to use matrices as well. Let us see here, so if uh, you have x axis, so suppose u is 1 0 0 that is x axis, then what happens? This matrix should reduce to the one that I had mentioned in the very beginning of this lecture. So, you, so this would be 1 minus cos theta plus cos theta because u x is 1 and then this term u x u y will be 0 and then minus u z again is 0 and then this term u x u z again this is going to be 0 and it's uy again it is going to be 0. Again ux into uy 0 and uz 0. This term ux uz 0 uy 0. So, so, you get 1 0 0 in a column as well as row. What about other terms? Let us see uy square. So, this term is going to be 0. So, what is going to remain is cos theta 
and here the only term that is going to survive is minus u x sin theta. So you have just minus sin theta. Here u y u z. So this term will go away. What will remain is u x sin theta. U x is one. So you have sin theta and u z square u z is zero. So what you have is cos theta. So you indeed have the matrix uh, that I had shown you in the beginning of this lecture. But again working with these kind of matrices is very cumbersome and this is not the approach we should be taking. So what is the point of all this? Here is a group, right? The group of rotations of sphere or the rotation group in R3. The group is there, group is well defined. The point is how to express that group, how to express, how to denote, how to make calculations for this group. We realize that Euler angles are not the best way to understand the group operation because uh, guessing in both the directions for a given rotation what are Euler angles and for a given Euler angle for a given combination theta, phi and psi what is the even axis of rotation that is not clear. And matrices as you can see here they are also quite cumbersome. So it is very important for us that given a group how we are going to express it, how we are going to extract mathematical information out of it. So as I said calculations are going to be messy if we keep this notation. So this is something quite important. You remember for R2, for rotations in R2, I had mentioned in earlier lecture that cos theta minus sin theta, sin theta cos theta is uh, matrix and one can also realize this as one can also realize it as multiplication by e to the power 2 pi i theta. So complex multiplication this is a complex multiplication and rotation they have something to do with each other and in terms of complex multiplication understanding rotations in two dimensions is quite easy. So that is the point like what we had in case of R2 can we think of an operation on R3 which resembles complex multiplication and helps us in understanding rotations. That is the question. And that is very interesting curiosity and that is what led Hamilton to the discovery of quaternions. There is a person William Rubin Hamilton and the point is here to find some operation on R3. So, I am thinking of some way to combine two vectors in R3 so that answer is again R3 and this rule whatever I define is actually resembling complex multiplication and also it is helping us in understanding rotations. So that is what is <coughs> a curiosity for us. So Hamilton wrote after his discovery of quaternions every morning uh, in October 1843 my son used to come to me and during the breakfast he was to he used to ask along with 
his brother papa can you multiply triplets so that's what is the reference triplets is multiplication in r3 and i was always obliged to reply with a sad shake of the head no i can only add and subtract them this is about uh, some multiplication in r3 which resembles complex multiplication and later actually in the same year of october 183 october 1843 he came up with this nice uh, idea for which there is a postal stamp as well in uh, ireland so he was actually walking through uh, walking on a bridge in dublin and just just this idea occurred to him and he wrote it on the stone there so this is apparently what he wrote on the stone so we're going to understand this so did he actually manage to multiply triplets did he actually manage to get an operation from r3 cross r3 to r3 which helped in understanding rotations not quite not at all actually okay so let's see what all were failed attempts of hamilton so what's the purpose i have one vector three dimensional another vector three dimensional so i'm denoting this as scalar axis i axis j axis just a notation so there are three axes those axes rather than calling x y z i'm calling scalar axis ith axis and jth axis so i'll denote vectors in terms of u and v like this a plus b i plus c j and x plus y i plus z j and i want to define this and what are my demands what are my demands so that this resembles quarter uh, this resembles uh, complex multiplication my demands are that this is associative and distributive so i want u star v when i multiply with w what i get is u star v star w that is associative t so if i force it then i should be getting uh, something like this so u star v if i put the distributive t then i should be getting something like this and uh, if you allow scalars to commute that is b and y to commute with symbols i and j with axis i and j in the multiplication then you get this so this i am writing question mark because if you allow this kind of commutativity so you get this kind of expressions and what are other demands so this is first demand associative and distributive other demand is there should be conjugation this is complex conjugation right similarly we are expecting a conjugation for three dimensional case so a plus b i plus c j should have conjugation a minus uh, b i minus c j and like what we have in uh, case of uh, r2 in case of two dimensions the concept of length is there which is just an element times its conjugate and that should be equal to a square plus b square plus c square and then we also want length rule when we have two vectors when when we have two complex numbers z1 and z2 the product of them and then you take the norm is same as product of individual norms individual norms of z1 and z2 so this is all what we are expecting from our multiplication so if if you want to uh, define this you really have to understand what is i square because i square is a new symbol here what is j square and what is ij what what is ji and what is ij so one needs needs to understand this that what is it going to be in terms of 
uh, I and J. And that was the crucial part of all this. So some observations are there. So you, if you want A square plus B square plus C square to be this element times its conjugate, then forcing the associativity and all that you get this. So what does it motivate? So if you make this with this, if you compare, then it motivates, it, you can't quite conclude from this, but some kind of motivation you can get that probably uh, here I have I square, probably I should be comparing this with this, uh, probably I should be comparing this uh, with this and so on. So some kind of motivation is there. And uh, there is no term of Ij here. So there is a term of Ij here, there is a term of Ij here, this term and this term. So probably they should cancel. In other words, Ij should be minus Ji. But then the, pro point, the, uh, then the problem is that what is Ij? One thing which is very clear is that such an operation if we define it cannot be commutative because if it is commutative <coughs> then i square uh, th then since i square is going to be j square which is the same as minus 1 this is going to hold i minus j times i plus j. So i square minus j square is going to be this if the operation is commutative and this being 0 meaning either i is j or i is minus j. So I can conclude from this that one of them is 0 because of norm consideration. So this implication comes because of norm considerations, because, of, because product of norms is same as norm of the product. So that is a contradiction because i and j they are two different axes, they are independent axes, they cannot be scalar multiple of each other. So that remains, the question remains what is ij and what is ji. We can easily conclude that ij is a unit vector. Why is that? Because norm of i is 1, so is norm of j and norm of ij square is product of individual norms which is 1 and therefore norm of ij is 1, norm of ij cannot be minus 1 because norms, norm is always positive. So this is what we get from this. So ij is certainly a unit vector but the point is to find what unit vector, what choice of unit vector will serve our purpose. So which of the vectors is equal to ij. So all these are failed attempts of uh, Hamilton, he is trying all the way all possible algebraic manipulations with the hope that he gets some nice uh, multiplication on R3 which resembles complex multiplication. Okay, no problem. So let ij be this and then what are the choices for a, b and c. So uh, there ij times j which is ij square is this and with some manipulation, so because j square is minus 1, so i minus i is this and making all these uh, calculations, it is not very difficult to conclude that b square is minus 1 because here I am just comparing the coefficients of this and other coefficients I have to put. 0. So b square is minus 1. So that is also giving some kind of contradiction because b is a real number and real squares can be uh, positive or no, 0 only. There is no possibility of a negative uh, number being a square in reals. So the question remains. Probably we, probably we should discard the idea that i square is minus 1 and j square is minus 1. So here is interesting piece of history. 
on Hamilton's discovery of quaternions, von der Weyden from University of Zurich, Switzerland, he wrote very nice article which is about failed attempts of uh, Hamilton to find uh, some operation on R3. So, a very nice article is worth reading. And that is what Hamilton realized after a series of failed attempts. You probably can't do it in three dimensions. Maybe you should define ij as a new axis, you should expand your dimension and you should go to four dimensional space and not in R3. So, you define a new symbol which is product of ij. So, there is one more dimension that is what he is uh, imagining and i into j should be that dimension and certainly k is not in the vector space. So, with this basic idea he started uh, thinking and then it was quite easy. It works. So, on R4 not R3 on R4 one can indeed define a very nice product formula very nice multiplication which resembles complex multiplication resembles in what sense all the conditions that I had mentioned earlier. So, whatever are the Hamilton's rules what were those it should be distributive and associative and uh, the concept of conjugation should be there and then the concept of norm should be there which is precisely an element times its norm. So, an um, uh, element times its conjugation. So, norm square is an element times its conjugation. So, this is what he is writing i j is uh, k. So, he, he is writing k i is equal to j like this. Okay, so let us see what does this give? I have i square minus 1, j square minus 1, and ij is k, and with some small manipulations, you can make work out that ij is minus j i. In fact, I had already said it while deducing i square is minus 1, j square is minus 1, I already said that probably ij is minus j i. So, let us try with this, let us try with this new idea. The only idea which is new here is that you are assuming that there is one more axis which is precisely the direction of i j. Okay. So, I have this, I have this, I have two vectors and this time these two vectors are in R4. I have one scalar axis and these three are if you want to say vector axis. So, using this actually one can make out that this is how it should be if I start putting i square to be minus 1, j square to be minus 1 and ij to be minus j i after making all the computation this is what we come up with. And then it is easy to check. So, that is maybe an exercise for you. Check that it works that is it is associative has concept of conjugation associative as well as distributive as conjugation. So, say uh, some vector v goes to v bar and has concept of norm. So, these conditions. So, the space R4, so the 4 dimensional space which is equipped with this operation, this way of multiplying vectors that is called quaternion algebra. And as we are going to see in few minutes, Quaternion algebra is going to be quite handy 
while understanding uh, represent uh, while understanding uh, rotations. So quaternionic space or quaternion algebra is denoted by H H in the honor of Hamilton as a four dimensional space with this operation. So let us see what kind of things can be can we achieve uh, by all this and can we actually answer our orig original question which was about rotations. Okay. So here is how we can connect rotations with quaternions. So whenever I have a vector I just write explicitly like this I keep the scalar part here and vector part here. This is one dimensional part, this is three dimensional part and this is the thing. This is so how rotations and quaternions are related. So we have written uh, this A plus B i plus C j plus D k quaternion. So these elements are called quaternions. So I have written the scalar part and vector part and when I multiply the star that I had defined earlier star that was defined here is precisely this. So this is so the operation of quaternion is precisely this. So when I multiply in the earlier the, the fashion in, the, in this fashion what I get is a component that involves scalar product as well as a component that involves cross product. Cross cross product of vectors and this is what dot product of vectors. I hope you remember what cross product of vectors is. So when you have two vectors, so u and v, they are vectors in R3. So I have one vector u, one vector v. So the cross product is having direction which is orthogonal to both of them. So what are the plane generated by u and v? The cross product is going to be orthogonal to that plane. So u cross v is going to be orthogonal to u perpendicular to u and also it is going to be perpendicular to v and its magnitude is going to be magnitude of u times magnitude of v times sin theta where theta is angle between u and v. So cross product of vectors is also appearing in this expression. So as I said dot product and cross product both, both are inbuilt in the quaternion product. And now we are going to see how a quaternion can be used to understand rotations. So it has vector information, vector is rotation axis and scalar information which is angle. So this is angle and this is uh, axis. So both the informations are there in this. Okay, so this is how uh, rotations can be understood via quaternions. You have vector and you have an angle theta. And I am asking you to consider this quaternion. This the vector part. So in this unit vector. In this unit vector, you just multiply by sin theta by 2, take that as a uh, vector part and consider scalar part to be simply cos of theta by 2. So what are the properties of this? Norm of Q is 1. So that is easy, easy to see that Q Q bar is 1. So when I say 1, 
maybe you should be thinking like 1 comma 0. So, the vector part is 0. So, this is so you can think of q q bar therefore as a scalar. So, norm of q is 1 and all the quaternions which have this property. So, in fact, if uh, you have a quaternion whose norm is 1, then q is of this form, this form, q is of this form, that is easy. So, all unit quaternions can be written like this. Okay, and this is uh, very relevant calculation. So, if you take a vector in R3, I am calling 0 p, I am considering this vector as a quaternion by putting the scalar part to be 0 and I am conjugating by unit quaternion. So, I am conjugating this vector by a unit quaternion. Unit quaternion meaning norm of the quaternion is 1 that is the meaning of unit quaternion. So, here is the unit quaternion, here is the unit quaternion and what is the meaning of conjugation? Conjugation meaning I am multiplying with q in the left and I am multiplying with q inverse in the right. So, since uh, q q bar is 1, it is easy to check that q is invertible, q has an inverse. So, q inverse does make sense. So, I have this and after doing all this calculation, uh, through all those matrix notations that I had mentioned earlier, one has to realize that this is the scalar part of this calculation is 0, while the vector part is precisely the vector which you obtain after rotating your original vector p by an angle of theta with u as axis. So, I will just write that r theta u p is what is uh, rotating p by an angle theta about axis which is determined by u. So, after rotating whatever vector you get that is this. So, this shows that the, uh, the, uh, the quaternions, unit quaternions and rotations are related. So, with all this we conclude that unit quaternions they form a group and therefore, they can be used to understand rotations. So, I have uh, H which is quaternions, I call this group H1 which is all those quaternions whose norm is 1 and I realize that I can write H1 as this collection where u x u y u z is a unit vector and theta is any angle.
So uh, H1 is precisely this collection. <coughs> Sorry. And as I have shown, given H1, you have R theta u. So, given an element of H1, maybe I should be saying that given an element this, so given, given this q, I have associated to this one rotation. One thing that one should observe is that if I have q, I have minus q. Both the elements actually give same r theta u. So, q and minus u are going to give you the same thing. So, because here I am multiplying with minus q, here I am multiplying with minus q inverse. So, minus 1 times minus 1 is 1. So, that will just go away. So, what we have is same r theta u. So, therefore, from H1, I can think of a map to the group of rotations SO3. And what is the property of this map? Property is that two different elements are going to same. So, this is what is called two-fold cover. of S O in fact this approach of using quaternions is very much used in computer games and animations. there is something called quaternion interpolation. So, that interpolation is very much used in animations. You have one frame here, another frame here. Those positions of those frames, those orientations can be understood in terms of quaternions and then it is easier to interpolate what is happening between those two frames. Uh, there have been other uh, advantages of uh, quaternions uh, as well. So, use of quaternions as rotations, you should maybe look for what is called gimbal lock problem and Apollo moon mission in order to appreciate why. Uh, our, uh, why the representation, why our rotation should be expressed in terms of quaternions. So, what did we learn from this lecture? We learned that the same group, which is group of rotations of sphere, we are denoting it by SO3. The same group has different ways of uh, interpretations. We, are, we can interpret the same groups, elements in various different ways. Uh, notations, not only the notations are different, the mathematical treatment of those notations is also different. We had matrix uh, notation which was quite cumbersome. We had Euler angles which were also very difficult to manage, but when we had quaternions, uh, it just so turns out that everything is about this multiplication. So, rotation is just about quaternionic multiplication. On the way, we also see how Hamilton uh, made all those attempts, many, the, many of those attempts were failed attempts, but eventually he succeeded in defining uh, something which is analogous to uh, complex multiplication and thus he uh, achieved quaternions and then we could use unit quaternions to produce rotations and in fact we could obtain a two-fold cover of group of rotations in R3. Uh, there are other situations also where one uh, type of notation or one type of mathematical treatment is better than other. Although 
as a group both the ways of understanding things are same. So quaternions are quite good example of that and in coming lectures we are going to explore more about groups and we are going to see why we should appreciate groups even more. Thank you.